My name, my name is John Fleming. I want to know, I have a Brita filter, which is one of the best ones you can buy. Um, do I still have that chlorophyte in that? Is it going to come out or am so, I okay? So, um, for chlorate, and Dan and others can speak to it, but perchlorate kind of came from the making of our solid state rockets. And um, I don't think, um, I, I'm sure that Brita would not say that it filters out um, the chlorate. So as good a filter as that granulated carbon is um, in that process, I would not rely on it to, to filter out. I, you'd need more kind of a reverse osmosis or some filter system at home that's a little more rigorous and industrial than that. So should I just buy regular water at the markets? I, I think the main, the, the main thing, um, just to get into drinking water a little bit, um, with drinking water, um, other than those who are not on a public water system, so people who are on private wells or systems that are less than 10 connections, most of us are on public water systems. Those public water systems have to meet the state drinking water requirements and are required to report to you if they're not meeting them. So um, I, I would spend a little bit of time and make sure that the water you're drinking, in fact, does contain perchlorate. Um, you heard from the mayor and, and city council member of, of the local actions. But um, certainly at the state level, we have the um, Division of Drinking Water, um, ICANN, and I give Denise the number to send out um, for that. So we have engineers whose job it is to go to each of the drinking water systems to make sure that they're in compliance. If they're not in compliance, um, they have to get into compliance and provide you with that information. But um, Britta is not, I don't think, going to do it, no. OK, thank you very much. Right. Bill? Hi, I'm Bill Bowling. And I would just uh, direct this question to uh, the Simi Valley uh, um, exactly. When is the agenda uh, agenda going to be um, taking over Golden State? When are you going to put that in the agenda? Because we would all love to be there to support that. That's what we're next, probably after the day. <laughs> um, because the mayor and the city manager are the ones who set the agenda dates. There's some things that you know are more of a priority. So uh, that's something you can also sign up for. Uh, city on the city council webpage, you can sign up, and it'll tell you what's going to be on the next agenda. It'll notify you, and it'll automatically send you the agenda. What's going to be on the city council, and you usually get it Wednesday or Thursday before the city council meeting. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll definitely make it a priority to get it on just as soon as possible. Um, I, I don't. We don't even have to have it on the agenda to to grab some water and do some testing. So we'll get that process going right away. I spoke to the city manager today about it. So that's going to happen, and, and I've got a little poll on getting stuff on the agenda, so I'm going to use that poll. I just want to add the timing of the testing for the water is very important. You'd want to do it during the rainy season when there might be some good runoff. Just while we're, Mr. Mayor, I'd also lend our services. The Division of Drinking Water can help make sure that the test is standardized and meets the state and federal standards so that, because there's lots of different labs and lots of different, we just want to make sure when you do it, it meets the standards that we would use and happy to help. Just one quick suggestion. <clears throat> the detection limit really matters. And um, Golden State's been using a detection limit of four, it's legal, but since the public health goal is one, we want to make sure that the layout is testing at a level that they can see the public health goal. Um, in addition, I would also recommend that uh, when we spoke with Golden State Water, uh, Leah and several other ladies and I, um, they, have not, they have not tested for tritium, which is radioactive water, more than twice in the last 12 years, even though tritium is very well known to come from the Santa Susana Field Lab. So um, I, I think a lot of the moms in the community would also appreciate, in addition to the pool chlorates, to also um, do the specific tested, testing needed for tritium. Yeah, that, that will be fine, and uh, you can contact me through the city manager's office, or I, I give my cell phone out. I know a lot of people think that's crazy. It's 805-750-0277. I want to hear what you have to say. I also have learned that there's 
particular times that would be better to take the sample versus, so we don't want to do it wrong. Let's do it right. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is to the secretary. Uh, my name is Christina Walsh, and my question is about the AOC. If you are enforcing the AOCs, um, they have penalties. Why haven't you assessed penalties of $15,000 per day per polluter, which amounts to over $50 million in the last three years? Um, why has that not taken place? It has been requested from your agency and has been denied. So, great question, um, and thank you for being here today. So, in terms of um, the enforcement actions, I didn't talk about it um, at length um, when, I, when I presented, but um, our goal is to use kind of all available tools at our disposal, um, and so enforcement penalties where they're warranted um, they are appropriate. Um, we need to make sure that we're understanding what we're doing and what we're getting um, within the enforcement context. Um, my goal primarily is to get cleanup and forward action, but to the extent that there's penalty. Sorry? Correct. Right. Right, so I'm, I'm suggesting that I'm, as we move forward, um, I can't make excuses for the past, and I'm not going to do that. What I'm committing to doing is using all our legal tools at our disposal to use them in the future um, where they make sense and are appropriate. And as an environmental attorney, I can tell you that um, we're not, I haven't been shy in my career to use them and where there are assessed penalties that, um, where there are assessed penalties um, that are appropriate and laid out as they are in the context of the AOC, we will use them. Thank you. In the, in the back there? Hi, oh, my name is Brandy Grace. Wow, this is really loud. Um, this is for you, Secretary. You spoke wonderfully about how we as citizens have to hold our elected officials and uh, Cal EPA accountable. Um, as somebody who is personally running to succeed Christy Smith in the Assembly, I'm, I'm frequently hearing from my opponents and from citizens that they think this is just a federal matter and not something the state can do. I'd like to hear from you. What do you think that all of us should be doing to hold our assembly and our state senator uh, members accountable? What kind of accountability do you want to see? What kind of actions do you want to see from us? Um, well, just kind of building on um, the, the work that both assembly and senators have done, starting with Julia Brownlee um, all the way through um, Christy Smith um, and, and Henry and, and um, Jesse, Gabriel, um, our, our goal is to make sure that the issues are understood. Um, so, you know, making sure that the clear baseline of information that this is one of the most toxic sites in the United States and certainly in California, that we need to have the tools at the disposal for the Department of Toxic Substance Control, that we need to get reform initiated and done so that the agency has both the oversight um, and accountability and funding and a vision that will allow it to do this job. Um, that we have the legal tools and the support of the Attorney General, um, that we um, are given the room to make sure that we can be effective, um, which the Governor certainly gives us, um, but the budget every year is a fight. Um, and frankly, just to give you a sense in California, um, I don't want to end on a low note, but there's about 150 to 200,000 abandoned um, hazardous sites in the state, 150,000. Um, and we do not have the ability in terms of the budget to investigate those, to prioritize those, to clean those up. So um, we have let this languish for way too long. So prioritizing public health in this community, we could be in a meeting um, at Quimetco or Exide, or the list goes on and on. Um, and every community I go to certainly doesn't have the level of pollution that we're describing here. But they're very significant for those communities. Um, and so I think prioritizing for the general welfare of the state of California, the importance of tackling these in a serious um, and targeted way would be a great start. Thank, Thank you. you. Gentleman in the brown shirt. Yeah. Thank you. 
My name is Dave Murphy. I've lived in Simi since 1962. I taught at Simi High for 38 years, economics and history. Uh, my question is for Dr. Hirsch. Uh, you've done tremendous research since, uh, since you discovered there was a meltdown. My question for you is, is there information out there <clears throat> from 1959 to 1979 that a common citizen like myself can read about how and why the government covered up the meltdown? First of all, just a clarification, it's Mr. Hirsch. <clears throat> no, um, the event occurred in July of 1959 and the Atomic Energy Commission didn't even issue a news announcement about it for five weeks. The press release was issued for, uh, to be embargoed until Saturday morning papers. And I don't know if you know anything about media, but in those days in particular, that's how you tried to bury a story. The headline of the press release said uh, that there had been a parted fuel element observed and then went on to say there was no evidence of unsafe operating conditions, no release of radioactivity. A third of the core, not just one fuel rod, a third of the core had experienced melting, not just parting. It uh, was one of the most serious nuclear accidents in history to that point. And they were at the very moment they issued the press release venting radioactive gases into the environment. So the answer why no one knew is because they kept it secret. And that's what the Atomic Energy Commission did over and over again during that time. But there's, there's no written documents. How did you end up discovering 78, 79? Um, the Three Mile Island accident occurred in Pennsylvania. Students working with me wanted to investigate whether there were any nuclear problems here in California. I was sure they wouldn't find anything. And within a few weeks, they uncovered in the archives to the UCLA Engineering Library the documents that this company had shipped over to UCLA because the head of Atomics International, Chauncey Starr, became dean of engineering at UCLA. And I should just tell you, one of the students working with me now from UC Santa Cruz is going with me tomorrow to uh, the archives for some other documents. OK, a uh, uh, purple shirt. And yeah, sorry to call you by your shirt colors, but I don't know everybody's name. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Matthew McHale. I'm a resident of Canoga Park. I'm also the minister at a church there, Emerson Unitarian Universalist Church. And so I'm relatively new, at least to this immediate area. I'm from Southern California and uh, relatively new to this issue. And the thing that, re the question that came, com comes up for me is, why would NASA sign the AOC and I guess Boeing sign the earlier AOC and then not follow through. Like, what? I, there's something I'm missing here that just that I'm not getting. Why would they sign it and then not actually do what they signed? You can, any of us, no. <laughs> Jared, that's yours. Um, 2016, we had an election, um, and I think there's been a change in posture on the behalf of the federal government to environmental protection generally, I think it would be safe to say. Um, and one of those is, let's save money wherever we can um, and reduce our expenses so that we can spend them on things that are perceived as more mission critical to those agencies. So these, I think, the, you know, the fight that we're having is to elevate these issues to that level of importance where um, the agencies feel that it's more productive to clean up than to fight the cleanup. Um, and that posture, I think, um, to the mayor's point um, about the, the trip, we actually have, I, see, I think, seen a really noticeable difference um, since um, Secretary Perry came out um, and a real willingness to think about how we could collaborate on some of those issues. So these discussions, these things do um, make a difference um, and lighting a fire under our federal government. I, I think, you know, for instance, the Kardashians um, have really made a difference in, in the public profile of this issue in Washington and people take that more seriously. And so the more we can do to highlight um, that this is important, um, we're not going away and they need to meet their financial and legal obligations, the more we'll get back to that place, hopefully. 
uh, uh, baseball camp. <laughs> Again, uh, sorry for referring to you by your clothing, but and then we'll we'll wrap up. Uh, uh, oh, we got more. Okay. Hi, my name is my name is Luke Busky. I'm um, in escrow on a house off Cuner Drive uh, in the 118 area. It, it's a Tremont Circle, and um. It's got a swimming pool, so it's more than drinking water. I mean, I got my baby swimming in that in the future if everything goes well with Espo. But mainly, this is about cleanup, and I want to know what cleanup entails. What I mean, I, I'm a truck driver, and I, I got a shovel. Um, I'm imagining it's removing earth and taking it where? I don't know. We throw it in the ocean? What do we do? What's, what does cleanup mean exactly? I talked a lot. You can, you can talk about it. You know. Look, it isn't rocket science. It's shovel work. Okay? And so some of the waste can be treated on site. So it can stay on site and is no longer contaminated. Others, you dig it up and you put it in a conveyor belt and take it down to a train. Or you put it in a uh, truck that is sealed and it goes, if it's radioactive, to a licensed low-level radioactive waste disposal site for which it's designed or to, if it's chemically t contaminated, it goes to a hazardous waste facility. So, you know, these are people who built reactors and who built rockets. Um, cleaning it up is shovel work. Okay. It goes to a licensed low-level radioactive waste disposal site, which is isolated from um, high population areas like this. Bottom line, you can't make waste go away. When we call, talk about disposal, it means moving it. One of the proudest moments of my life working with many of you here was when there was an illegal effort to ship radioactive waste from this site to a uh, low-income, largely Hispanic community, farm worker community in the Central Valley. And whereas in other places you might see people saying, get it out of here, I don't care where it goes, the people in this room who stood and protested that waste being dumped where it wasn't supposed to go. Do one or two more, and then we have uh, cards to fill out for folks. If we don't get to your questions, we will uh, answer them. Um, uh, peach shirt on the end there. Hi, my name is Samantha Guzman, and. Um, my question is that the Los Angeles River headquarters is in uh, Simi Hills and uh, Santa Ana uh, or Santa Susana uh, Mountains, and it's flowing 51 miles. Um, how far um, ha have we found these um, contamination sites along that 51 mile uh, flow? Is <laughs> the headwaters of the Los Angeles River um, is on the Santa Susana Field Lab. You'll enjoy the uh, uh, part of the headwaters built, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, Happy Valley, uh, where Dayton Creek comes out. And they found uh, perchlorate at 64 million parts per billion in Dayton Creek, in the area that's now that new housing development in Dayton Canyon. They found it at Orchid Ranch, that park that is an uh, orchard where kids go to see fruit growing and pick it. Um, and then it went into the LA River. There's no way that it didn't go all the way to the ocean, right? I mean, wh what's going to stop it? Um, the only thing that stops it is by cleaning up the source. Remember that this contamination was created beginning in the 1940s and we're still debating about whether or not it will ever be cleaned up. It's, again, not rocket science. You clean up the source. So it'll keep moving. Yes, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add also that from a, a parent's perspective, uh, what's difficult about the site is that the, the contamination isn't in barrels. Like, like we were talking about Hanford, that it's literally, they know how much it is, they know. We know where it is, but it's, it's particular matter, right? It goes in the dust, it goes in the wind. And so part of the question is, how much contamination does a fetus need to be affected by, or how much does a young child need to be exposed? There's, there's um, contamination there, strontium-90, I believe. It acts like calcium. 
and it actually absorbed into the bones, and they found it in the bones of uh, teeth of children from Fukushima. And so this is why this is such a big concern here, is because when any of that goes off, plutonium, for example, has a 24,000 year half-life. This stuff isn't, isn't going to go away anytime soon, no matter what you do to it, unless you take it away. So that's part of the reason why, as, as parents, we're so concerned that this moves, it moves off site, it's hard to track. It's hard to know, like we said, that we don't know if my daughter's cancer was caused by it because we don't know at what dosage, on what day, of what contaminant, at what, you know, that's not information we can ever get. And so it seems to me part of the reason we're concerned is that children all the way through LA, we can't ever tell them what they were exposed to because here. And so I feel like we also have a responsibility not only to our community, but to the greater community of Los Angeles who goes along the river and even the Pacific Ocean. And we know that contamination um, from Japan has reached California. I think it's reasonable to assume that something that's going to exist for 26,000 years as a dangerous radionuclide, you know, that, that's going to reach a lot of people. And um, one other thing I want to throw in real quick, part of the reason that we are so adamantly fighting for that full cleanup is that sites like ours exist across America. And they tend to be, we're kind of actually the anomaly, they tend to be very, um, economically disadvantaged communities, and that's intentional. They'll intentionally find communities that can't fight for themselves, and they'll put a lot of the waste there. Um, Department of Energy is kind of infamous for that. And so what we're hoping, too, is to take this cleanup here with the high standards, almost, almost um, they're not impossible standards, but they are the high standard, and that was the intention of the Nobel Peace Prize winner who wrote it, was because this has the potential to affect the rest of America with their cleanups and the people who can't fight for themselves, and the people by the LA River, and the people God knows where who might actually be exposed because of the pathway. Um, and that's part of the reason why the site is so dangerous and why our responsibility isn't just to us, but um, for a much, much larger community. Okay, we're gonna take one more. Uh, Lauren, is that you with your hand up? Yeah. That's a perfect, uh, we'll be around here. We've got question cards. If you have to go, leave your cards with one of us. If you don't have to go, some of us will be around. Um, but we'll, uh, we want to close this portion of the meeting. Um, okay, so to kind of piggyback on that question, since it has spread, has, it has come off site, we do get a full cleanup. We still have to protect ourselves from the things that are remaining that cannot be cleaned up because it's not on site any longer. So what do you recommend? You said something about reverse osmosis, but what do you recommend for members of our community to do to protect ourselves because we feel very powerless, like I said, outside, and we want to feel like we can do something and take an active role in protecting our families. Yeah, so the, the exposure pathways, the two primary ones that we've discussed are water and air. And so I think just as we've, and, and soil, but if we focus on, on air and water for a second, um, so the, the questions, for instance, um, that Melissa was asking the mayor to make sure we're not looking just at perchlorate, but are there any radionuclides or other issues, often people aren't looking um, in the normal course of business. So um, the two entities that, other than Department of Toxic Substance Control, um, at the local level um, would be the regional, the LA Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, there's you know, I think there, there have been exceedances that, that were described by Dan and others, but also making sure that there are appropriate penalties that were not, not to mix our metaphors, but not diluting going from numeric standards to narrative standards. Um, we make sure that the air district, um, in terms of looking at airborne material and air monitoring of very fine material, which is called PM10 or PM2.5, which is very, very fine toxic air contaminants, that we're, that we're looking for them. If you don't look for them, you're definitely not going to find them. So helping the regulatory agencies make sure that what they're looking for, and then it's their job, right? It's their job to determine the sources, to hold the entities accountable. Um, and in the context of soil cleanup, that there's, there's local um, jurisdiction, but there's also other roles that the Department of Toxic Substance Control has to make sure. So those three entities really need um, to hear from you, um, both at the, the very local concern about your well, um, 
the dust blowing from the vacant lot next door or um, the issues of contamination that you believe may be you know, uh, under your house um, at time of sale or whatever the issue is. There are entities um, at local, state, and federal level that are here to make sure that you have the information that you need. So um, bringing them, they, they may not know as much as you know um, about many of these issues. So bringing this issue to their attention and making sure it's part of their monitoring and evaluation and their protocols is critical. And I, I would just uh, add to that that uh, we need to stop it from going off of site. And one way is, like you stated, um, is to hold the polluter accountable. Those 57 exceedances uh, resulted in zero fines. And oftentimes, as we've been watching it, uh, Boeing has not been fined for those exceedances. You look at uh, Boeing's one of the largest corporations in America. You're looking at the United States government, which is one of the largest governments in the world. Um, the question is, uh, why aren't they living by the AOC? Uh, they have the money, and they can do it, and it's up to us to push them because they're not doing it.